welcome to our first Engineers Newsletter live broadcast in 2006. I'm Mick Schwedler, an Applications Engineer at Train, and I'll be both your host and a presenter as we discuss variable speed drives on system components. Over the past decade, the industry has seen the quality of variable speed drives get better, seen them applied on larger pieces of equipment and drop in cost. This has led to them being accepted and used more. Today's question is, where are they best to apply in HVAC systems, and how does varying the speed of a system component affect that component's energy use? First, some quick paperwork. Through our association with the American Institute of Architects, continuing education units can be issued for today's broadcast. To receive CEUs, AIA members need to provide their member number and name to your local hosts before leaving today's session. In some states, AIA registration allows engineers to receive CEUs also, but that changes by state. So please check with your local rules. Our objectives today are to help you understand how varying the speed of a component works in theory as well as in practice, and how the different components can accrue more or less energy savings, but must be controlled properly in order to achieve those savings. As engineers, whenever we're asked to apply a technology, we need to know how and when it offers benefit to the user. With respect to variable speed drives, we'll look at the operation of them as well as the physics behind what are called the fan laws. Then we'll move beyond theory to how the piece of equipment is actually controlled in real life. During those portions of the broadcast, we'll also examine the effect of energy use of that system component. Throughout the broadcast, we'll use the terms variable speed drive and variable frequency drive interchangeably. In either of these cases, we're talking about a technology that changes the speed of the rotating equipment. Presenters today include Don Eppelheimer from our Applications Engineering Group. Don's 34 years of chilled water plant experience is only overshadowed by his unique ability to take a tough subject and make it very understandable. Lee Klein from our Systems Marketing Group will use his extensive knowledge of controls to help us examine the effect of those controls on the system and its energy use. A newcomer to our broadcasts is Ryan Geister, manager of our Centrifugal and Absorption Chiller Department. Ryan's background in both chillers and training give him a unique perspective to help us understand the internal workings of the chiller. Don will cover the fundamentals. Then Lee will take us through cooling tower fans since they most closely follow the theoretical model. Then Don will show us how VAV fans operate within HVAC systems and we'll see how the savings start to deviate from the theory. Lee will follow with application of a VFD on the chilled water pump and discuss controls. After Lee finishes, I'll be back to take us through the other side of the system, and we'll see what happens when condenser water pump flow is varied. Finally, Ryan will cover the heavy metal, and we'll see that due to the external effects of chilled water and condenser water temperatures, a variable speed drive on a chiller reacts differently than any fan or pump in the system. Following the presentations will be our question and answer session. So Don, please take us through the speed control on a piece of equipment and how it theoretically affects the performance. Well, let's start at the very beginning. This famous formula reminds us energy is proportional to velocity squared. The speed of light is slightly less than 300 million meters per second. In our field, we move things a little slower. As plumbers, we pump water at a snail's pace of about two meters per second. When it comes to moving air, we step on the accelerator a little bit and race around the ductwork at speeds approaching 20 meters per second. While we don't move air and water with great velocity, we do move large quantities of air and large quantities of water. Consider this cooling tower serving a 600 ton chiller. In one hour, it moves half a million pounds of air and receives 600,000 pounds of water. 
Some want to pump even more. The science of air conditioning is the art of designing air distribution systems and water distribution systems to move massive amounts of air and massive amounts of water with as little energy as possible. It is appropriate that we investigate methods of providing comfort with smaller indoor fans, smaller cooling tower fans, and smaller pumps for both chilled water and cooling water. We can also improve system efficiency by exploiting load, load diversity to the greatest extent possible. At times when the air conditioning load is less, we should move less air. When cooling loads are less, we should move less water. When the ambient wet bulb temperature is lower, we should move less air through the cooling tower. Variable air volume, variable primary flow of chilled water, and chiller tower optimization are clear examples of reducing match flow to match the current need. All of these energy saving techniques require some means of reducing flow. Variable frequency dries are prime candidates for this assignment. The work of a fan, pump, compressor, or any other device to move mass is a function of how much mass is moved and how hard we have to push to move that mass, or resistance. Remember, our primary task is to air condition the space or cool the process. Moving air and pumping water is a method of transporting the heat we wish to remove. Of course, we hope each unit of mass carries as much heat as possible. This is accomplished by increasing the temperature rise of air and water. Two engineers newsletters, Cold Air Makes Good Sense, and How Low Flow Systems Can Help You Give Your Customers What They Want, are included in the bibliography. So how do we measure this resistance? Sometimes engineering is the feat of making the simple seem complex. This is the darcy weisbach equation that quantifies the resistance to flow measured in units of pressure. It looks complicated, but that's only because of the versatility of this equation. It works for any well-behaved fluid, including air and water. It also works any place. For example, as soon as we know what planet we're on, we know the gravitational constant, g sub c. When we know the roughness of the pipe and the viscosity of the fluid, we can determine the friction factor. Knowing the fluid, we know the density of what we wish to move. And to make the fluid go where we want it to go, we need a pathway, ductwork for air and pipe for water. Once the air distribution system or water distribution system is defined, we know the length and the diameter of the conduit. The only variable left is velocity. Resistance is proportional to velocity squared. Now that the resistance or static pressure loss we must overcome to move a given quantity of air through the air distribution system can be determined, let's turn our attention to the device that moves the air, the fan. Fans obey a list of rules we call fan laws. First rule, the faster we shovel, the more stuff we can move. The volume of air moved is proportional to the rotational fan speed, or revolutions per minute. Second rule, pump head, or fan static, is proportional to RPM squared. In these equations, CFM and RPM are interchangeable. This means static pressure produced by the fan is proportional to the velocity of the air moved by the fan squared. Note how this matches the resistance to velocity predicted by the darcy weisbach equation, which reminds us resistance is also proportional to velocity squared. How fortuitous. We should find some way to exploit this. And it gets even better. Third rule. The energy required to move air or pump water is proportional to RPM cubed. Everybody wants to save energy. The fan laws also apply to pumps. Fan laws, pump laws, or affinity laws, as we sometimes call them, are different names for the same set of relationships. How come we don't have chiller laws? Chillers do have to obey the same rules of physics. However, in a refrigeration system, resistance to mass flow is not a function of refrigerant velocity. The resistance a compressor must work against is the pressure difference between condenser pressure and evaporator pressure. 
we call this pressure difference lift. Ryan will tell us more about lift and compressor work later in the broadcast. Lee, how about applying these fan laws to cooling tower fans? Okay, Don. Thanks for the physics review. We'll refer to it more than once to make sure we're not breaking these laws as we discuss drive applications. The first application of a drive we will examine will be for a free discharge fan. The example we'll use for this type of fan is a draw-through cooling tower. Another example of a system with free discharge fans is fan coil units. Later, Don will come back and discuss different types of fans and their control characteristics. I'm sure most of you are familiar with a draw-through cooling tower. The one shown here uses a propeller-type fan mounted on top, which pulls air through the tower louvers, fill, and falling water. The tower cooling effect is caused by the evaporation of some fraction of the water as it falls from the distribution pans on the top to the collection sump at the bottom. For the purpose of exploring the performance of free discharge fan systems, we are going to ignore the impact of changes in air density at different tower loads. So, what do the fan laws tell us about the performance of this system? As Don discussed, the total pressure the fan must work against at various loads is related to approximately the square of the airflow rate. But this is really true only for free discharge fan systems. Many fan system applications require a fixed static pressure component as shown on this system pressure flow diagram. This actually pushes the system curve up and causes a deviation from the fan law prediction. But we'll let Don worry about the effect of this. The good news is, with a cooling tower, is that there is no fixed static pressure component. So the fan law equations describe the system performance pretty well. For our purposes, this will be the definition of a free discharge system, one in which the static pressure component is equal to zero. The result is that the system curve intersects the chart's origin and the pressure rises per the square of the flow to the system design point. Now that we understand the system curve, we need to look at the fan curve for a propeller type fan and see how it interacts with the system curve. The basic fan curve at a specific speed might look similar to this. It rises somewhat from the block tight, no flow condition, then at higher flow falls to the final design volume and pressure. When you slow the fan speed, the whole curve shifts downward. At a given static pressure, at a lower speed, the fan moves less volume. What about the fan's mechanical efficiency at different loads and speeds? If you were to draw lines of equal fan mechanical efficiency between the different speed curves, they would lay in something like this. The exact efficiency curves are dependent on the fan design. The most important question we must answer is, how does all of this interact with the system curve? Let's add the system curve back and see what observations we can make. When we add the free discharge system curve, we see one characteristic that makes it a great application for variable speed capacity control. The system curve typically tracks relatively closely to the fan constant efficiency lines. So, if an efficient fan is chosen at design conditions, it will maintain its mechanical efficiency as the capacity is reduced via speed reduction. Let's look at some fan energy curves using a few different capacity control methods. If the tower's capacity is modulated by varying the fan speed so that the fan curve tracks the system curve, the fan's energy use would follow this orange curve. The fan energy use is proportional to approximately the cube of the speed. How else might the airflow be modulated? Simple on-off control could be used to achieve an average fan velocity based on the time-weighted average of full on and full off airflow. In this case, the theoretical fan energy use would follow the straight line between the full on and full off energy values. It's obvious that at any fan airflow other than zero and 100%, this control strategy's energy use is significantly greater than that for variable speed. 
The area between the orange curve and the black line represents the potential energy savings between the two forms of control. The other historically common method for varying cooling tower capacity is the application of a two-speed motor, or two different motors, a large motor for design conditions, and a smaller pony motor that operates at lower speed. In this application, the fan cycles between high, medium, and off. The energy used in achieving a specific average fan volume is based on the time weighted average of the runtime at these three speeds. It's really interesting that just by using a two speed fan, you could come very close to achieving the fan energy of variable speed control. However, this comes at the cost and complexity of a two speed motor, or two motors, and the accompanying electrical switch gear. In the past, the cost of the motor and switch gear was less than the cost of a VFD. But with a continued drop in the cost of VFDs, we understand that in a number of cases, VFD cost is the same or even less than a two-speed motor and switch gear. So let's talk about the application of VFDs. The fan energy drops with the cube of the speed. But what does the customer's utility meter see? If we plot the electrical energy use of the tower fan motor, we see that it tracks above the fan energy curve. The motor and VFD energy ratings must be applied to get the actual energy used. Depending on the motor and VFD selected, this would be between 3 and 6 percent at full load and greater at part load. What does this all mean in terms of actual energy savings? Here's an example that tells it all. When controlling a cooling tower to a fixed set point, a two-speed motor draws less than half of a single-speed motor application. A VFD application could save close to 80 percent, both very impressive percentages. There is some other good news when it comes to draw-through cooling tower operation. It has nothing to do with fan operation and results in significant free cooling. Because of its open construction, a draw-through cooling tower can provide between 5 and 15 percent of its rated capacity with its fan off. Therefore, at low system loads, the tower can provide true free cooling. This is good news no matter what type of fan modulation you use. It's one of the few times you get something for nothing, as long as you ignore the condenser water pump energy anyway. As we've seen in this discussion, free discharge fan applications benefit greatly from variable speed control. With little or no fixed static pressure, they can take full advantage of the fan law relationships. We're often asked if variable speed drives should be applied in building HVAC systems. When it comes to cooling tower control, I would suggest the answer is a resounding yes, almost always. Don? I got the easy fan type. How about you do some hard work and discuss the operation of other fan applications? Okay, thanks Lee. Let's turn our attention to an indoor fan and the associated ductwork to deliver the air. Assume that a system is designed to deliver 3500 CFM and that to overcome system pressure losses, the fan must generate two inches of static pressure. The Darcy Weisbach equation tells us the static pressure losses vary with the square of airflow. This system resistance curve represents the static pressure that the fan must generate at various airflows to overcome the resistance or static pressure loss within this particular system. This curve is true only if all the elements of the duct system obey the darcy weisbach equation. We have found devices in the air distribution system that don't follow the darcy weisbach relation. Valves. Actually, valves seem to do just the opposite of Darcy Weisbach. Air valves and water valves appear to produce the highest pressure loss when flow is low and produce a lower pressure drop when mass flow is high. Valves are the devices we employ to regulate mass flow. Valves regulate mass flow by consuming energy, energy produced by the fan or pump. Air valves in a VAV system and water valves in a variable primary system 
alter the system resistance curve by creating more or less resistance to mass flow. This modulation causes the actual system resistance curve to shift. In a VAV system, therefore, the fan no longer operates at a single point on its performance curve, but must operate over a range of points. Fans create the pressure necessary to overcome resistance to flow imposed by the ductwork. The geometry of the fan will influence fan efficiency as well as the relation between airflow, static pressure, and power. For example, many of you may recognize this as this fan curve as typical of a forward curve fan. This curve graphically illustrates the performance of this fan when it is operated at a constant speed. The curve extends from block tight static pressure with a corresponding zero airflow to a wide open airflow with a corresponding zero static pressure. The fan laws predict the performance characteristics of the fan at other rotational speeds. Airflow is proportional to RPM and static pressure is proportional to RPM squared. The result is a family of curve that represent airflow capacity and static pressure at various fan speeds. The fan is compelled to obey the fan laws. Resistance imposed by ductwork is predicted by the darcy Weisbach system resistance curve. Fan and ductwork both operate at the same point, that point where the system curve and the fan curve intersect. But variable air volume is a dynamic system with an ever-changing system resistance curve and a large family of fan curves at various speeds. In a VAV system, the quantity of air being delivered to each space is controlled by an air valve. This device is controlled by a thermostat to provide only the quantity of conditioned air needed to balance the space load. As the air valves modulate, the overall system resistance changes as well as the desired airflow. We need some type of control system to alter the CFM moved by the fan as well as changing the static pressure produced by the fan. These curves describe the performance characteristics of various methods of fan capacity control. Many methods of fan control have been employed. Fan speed control can be applied to any type of fan and practically all fan applications. What is it we want the fan modulation system to do? Is it more than just save energy? There are a number of assignments given to a capable fan capacity control system. First, the capacity control system must keep fan static pressure within the desired range. But we also want the control to be stable, we want to save lots of energy, and of course we want everyone to be comfortable. When the static pressure upstream of the air valve or damper is too low, the VAV unit is unable to deliver the desired airflow. Comfortable conditions cannot be maintained no matter how low we set the thermostat we better give the maintenance department a call. Excessively high upstream static pressure can cause more problems than just wasting energy. High duct pressures make airflow control difficult and can increase damper generated noise. Why is my desk located under the noisy ductwork? In order to ensure adequate static pressure at the VAV terminal units, a simple control loop is used. First, Static pressure is sensed from a location in the system. Next, a controller compares the static pressure reading to the system's set point. Finally, fan capacity is varied to deliver the required airflow at a static pressure that maintains the set point at the location of the system sensor. That seems simple. Where do I locate the sensor? A better understanding of how fan capacity is controlled will help answer that question. Assume that the air conditioning load decreases, causing all or some of the VAV dampers to modulate closed. This causes the system resistance curve to shift upwards. In response, the fan begins to ride up its performance curve. As a result, the fan delivers a lower airflow, but at a higher static pressure. The system static pressure controller senses this higher static pressure and sends a signal to the supply fan controller to reduce fan speed. 
A lower fan speed results in a new fan system balance point, bringing the system static pressure down to the sensor set point. This action results in the fan unloading along a curve called the VAV system modulation curve. This curve represents the fan modulation needed to balance the static pressure produced by the fan with the static pressure required by the system sensor. The fan operating point will always be on the VAV system modulation curve because fan speed is controlled by the static pressure sensor, not the velocity squared predicted by Darcy Weisbach. The sensor needs some non-zero measurable set point. Substantial energy is saved, however, some of the dampers will be throttling flow and consuming energy. It is the need for fan control that causes energy saved to be less than the predicted RPM cubed. Notice we control system static pressure, not system CFM. One possible location for the static pressure sensor is near the outlet of the supply fan. The controller is set to maintain the static pressure required at design flow. The appeal of this method is that the sensor can be factory installed and tested, resulting in greater reliability and no field installation cost. If fire dampers are included in the supply duct, this method ensures that the sensor is on the fan side of the damper so that the duct is protected from high pressures. Also, depending upon the layout of the duct system, this method may eliminate the need for multiple duct sensors. It is not, however, as energy efficient as other methods. This concept requires all the dampers to throttle back, increasing fan static to a level above design. Sensing this overpressure, the fan controller will reduce fan RPM. However, the savings presented by this form of speed control are limited because all the dampers are throttled to an energy wasting position. In the most common method for sensing and controlling system static pressure, the static pressure sensor is located in the supply duct. Determining the best sensor location for all load conditions can be difficult, often determined by trial and error or by using multiple sensors. A typical starting point is two-thirds of the distance between the supply fan and the end of the supply duct. Why two-thirds? Notice that dampers located downstream of the static pressure sensor have no vote. Because the controller maintains a fixed static pressure upstream of these zones, these dampers must close, wasting fan energy, in order to deliver the desired airflow in those zones. Fan energy savings can be increased by moving the sensor further down the air distribution system. This will increase the amount of load diversity sensed above the static pressure sensor location. In essence, more dampers are allowed to move to a more open position. Less fan energy is wasted by dampers throttled closed. There is a possibility that this fire location is not sensitive to all upstream damper conditions. Some dampers upstream of the sensor may be starved for air. The simple solution is a higher set point at the static sensor. This defeats the gain of moving the sensor downstream. In the end, static pressure sensor set point may be more critical than the actual location of the sensor. ASHRAE standard 90.1 requires static pressure set point to be no greater than one third the total design fan static pressure if this type of control method is used. An optimized static pressure control method combines the location related benefits of fan outlet control with operating cost savings that exceed those of supply duct static pressure control. A single static pressure sensor is located in the fan outlet and the controller dynamically adjusts the static pressure set point based on damper position of the VAV units. The DDC VAV controllers know damper position and because they are pressure independent, they modulate damper position to maintain the required airflow. The building automation system continually pulls the VAV units looking for the most open damper. 
the controller resets the static pressure set point so that at least one damper, the one requiring the highest inlet pressure, is nearly wide open. The result is that the supply fan generates only enough static pressure to get the required airflow through this critical VAV damper. This method allows the sensor to be factory installed and tested. If the VAV units use DDC control, the system level communications are all already in place, making this the lowest cost, highest energy saving strategy. ASHRAE Standard 90.1 requires VAV systems with direct digital control of individual zone boxes reporting to the central control panel to reset static pressure control point based upon the zone requiring the most pressure. A comparison of these static pressure control methods demonstrates the energy savings potential. At this representative part load condition, using the optimized static pressure control method allows the supply fan to use only 43% of its full load power versus 55% for the duct supply static pressure control method. In addition to the supply fan energy savings, because the optimized static pressure method control allows the system to operate as if the static pressure sensor was at each individual VAV terminal, it ensures that no spaces are starved for air. There are also acoustical benefits at part load by operating the supply fan and the VAV terminal units at the lowest possible duct static pressure. Wow, Don, so much for the thought that a fan is a fan is a fan. That's a great reminder that the application and control really does impact the benefit of the modulation technology applied. Let's now turn to pumps, variable flow and variable speed. Of course, we're interested in pumps because they consume a significant amount of global energy. According to the DOE, better pumping system design and control could save up to one-fifth of the total pumping energy used worldwide. Also, the use of variable water flow in HVAC systems is an exploding trend. One reason is because of its energy savings potential, and a second is that many codes require it. ASHRAE 90.1, for example, requires that any heating or cooling water system that has a total pump power that exceeds 75 horsepower and has more than three control valves must be variable flow. In addition, once any system pump that must overcome 100 feet of pressure difference has at least a 50 horsepower motor, it must have the capability to greatly reduce its energy consumption at system part load conditions. This is almost always achieved by using a variable speed drive on the pump motor. Okay, so let's assume we have a variable flow chilled water system. Let's look at an example system and see how it reacts to variable flow and how different pump control options impact pump energy use. Shown here is a flow diagram for a simple two chiller variable primary flow system. Let's take this system and examine its pressure drop profile at full and part load flows using different pump control techniques. We're going to plot the system pressure profile on a chart below the system diagram. We'll start at one point and plot the fluid pressure variation as it flows around the system. This will help us to visualize the impact of different pump control strategies on system components. For the full load plot, we'll start at the inlet to the pump. We see that the pump must raise the pressure from its inlet to its discharge equal to the total pressure drop of the system. The pressure of the water leaving the pump drops in proportion to the supply piping friction until it reaches the air handler coil control valves. The valve's job is to control the flow to the coil by devouring or wasting as much pressure as required so the coil flow just meets the cooling load demanded by the space. It will be important to observe how the valve pressure drop changes under different load conditions and with different pump control strategies. The water leaves the control valve and flows through the coil, finally doing the work for which it was chilled. The water pressure continues to drop as the water flows back to the inlet of the pump via the return piping. 
the pressure drop in this chart ignores the fact that there might be a triple duty valve or balancing valve on the outlet of the pump reducing its flow to the desired design value. If we were to include the triple duty valve for balancing flow in the system, its pressure drop would appear something like this. This is another case where we waste pressure and therefore energy to control the system flow. A balancing valve should only be required on a constant volume system if the pumps are oversized. Because we are working with a variable flow system, an energy consuming system balancing valve is an unneeded device. Let's plot the system and pump curves on a flow versus pressure chart. As the system flow increases, the pressure drop rises up in accordance with the pump affinity laws. The pump pressure falls following that particular pump's flow versus pressure curve. The intersection of the curves represents the design flow and pressure drop operating point for the system. If we add the pumping power to this chart, we can, we can find the corresponding pump power for the system. We also see that the power drops per the pump affinity laws. Its drop is proportional to the change in flow and pressure drop. The key question that we want to answer is, how does the system unload with various load control techniques? We'll start by examining a system that varies its capacity simply by throttling the control valves and riding the pump curve. Let's see what this looks like on the system and pump curve and then on a system diagram. The pump in this case is operating at a constant speed and its curve is fixed. If we want to reduce the system flow and therefore capacity, we must add resistance to the system to push the system curve back up the pump curve. This is what's known as riding the pump curve. The way resistance is added to the system is simply by modulating the control valves more closed. Note that the lower the flow, the higher the pump pressure and the more pressure the control valves must close off against. The pump energy saved is proportional to the reduction in flow and inversely proportional to the increase in pump pressure. Therefore, the actual energy saved is a function of the shape of the pump curve. If the pump curve is flat, then the savings will be significant. If the pump curve is steep and the pressure rises quickly, then the savings will be smaller. That's why on this type of system, pumps with a flat curve should always be selected. Let's view this capacity reduction strategy on the system pressure profile. The gray lines you see are the original full load pressure profile we plotted a few slides ago. We'll superimpose the part load lines over top of these for reference. Remember, the goal is to lower the flow through the coil to reduce its capacity. So this time, we'll start the plot with it. Who or what is it in the system that accomplishes this flow reduction? Well, obviously, it's the control valve. But wait, this shows the control valve's parasitic pressure drop went way up, much more than the coil's pressure drop went down. Why is that? Since the flow is down, the frictional pressure drop of the supply and return piping is less, so the valve must compensate. But also, remember that the pump is riding up its flow pressure curve. So at this lower flow, the pressure it produces is greater. From a pressure point of view, the pump works harder at part load. The situation looks pretty bleak, doesn't it? Well, not really. Systems have been designed and operated like this for many years. As long as you pick a pump with a flat curve to minimize the pump pressure rise, the flow-based energy savings will be dominant. Don't forget another key element in making this type of system work. That is to specify control valves with sufficient close-off pressure ratings. Rather than ride a single pump curve, let's try applying multiple pumps of different sizes. Here again, we see our design condition system pump curve. If we have uh, available a second smaller pump selected for a lower flow at a lower pressure drop for part load, not only will the system pressure go down rather than up, but the pump's power curve will be lower also. Add a third, even smaller pump for even lower loads and it gets even better. Maybe we're on to something here. 
but the complexity of selecting and operating all these different pumps would be daunting. Well, this is really just a bait and switch on my part. Having a variable speed pump is really just like having an infinite number of different size pumps. Excellent! We can have the perfectly sized pump at every load if we can control the pump speed to slide down the system curve rather than riding up the pump curve. Now this is a neat concept, but the actual energy use can vary greatly depending on how the pump speed is actually controlled. If we don't control the pump speed to ride the system curve, we will not achieve the potential energy savings. Again, let's examine a few examples and see the impact of different control methods. We'll look at these three pump control methods and graphically evaluate their impact on system energy use. Let's start with a strategy that controls the pump speed to maintain the design pressure at the pump at all loads. We'll start plotting at the pump again since its pressure is our controlled variable. The pump's pressure rise is controlled to the design value. It does not change with load. Because of the lower flow, the frictional pressure drop through the supply and return piping is less. The control valve must again devour the amount of pressure required to lower the coil flow. Because of the pump pressure control, it wastes less than would have been the case if we were riding the pump curve. The decreased flow through the coil shows itself in the form of lower pressure drop. It's interesting to note that the total pressure drop through the control valve and coil is still greater at part load than it was at design. But if we've gone as far as putting in a variable speed pump and a DDC control system, can't we do better with our control strategy? The answer is absolutely. Let's try controlling the pump speed to a pressure that we measure at the end of the system. A differential pressure transducer is typically installed at the furthest most point in the system. Since we're controlling the pressure across the control valve and coil, let's start a pressure plot there. The pressure here stays constant at reduced flows. The control valve only has to waste the amount of pressure drop the coil gives up, much less than in other cases. As we've seen before, the lower flow through the supply and return piping results in less pressure drop. Ultimately, the pump pressure is significantly less than the design condition. This results in much lower pump energy as well as better pump operation. Let's examine just one more strategy to see if we can squeeze just a little bit more energy savings out of our system. Maybe it won't be so little. What if instead of controlling to a fixed set point somewhere in the system, we controlled based on the actual air handler cooling demand. If the HVAC control system is integrated enough, we can monitor the air handler load via the control valve position. This is sometimes called critical valve pump pressure control. Here's this control strategy pressure profile starting at the control valve. By monitoring the valve's position and reducing the pump pressure, keeping the most demanding valve almost wide open, the pressure drop through that valve will drop with reduced flow rather than rise. The pressure drop through all the other control valves will drop also. The coil and, and supply and return piping pressure all drop because of reduced flow. The resulting pressure at the pump is as low as possible at every load condition. This results in the lowest possible pump operating energy. Critical valve pressure reset virtually eliminates the system fixed pressure component and therefore it allows the pump savings to approach the pure pump affinity law prediction. From an operational point of view, it just does not get much better than this. Now, just to reinforce the different strategies impact on pump energy, let's quickly view each on a pressure flow diagram. If we examine the ride the pump curve strategy, we see that as the system unloads, the GPM drops, but the pump pressure rises. The area in pink represents the pressure the valve must devour at part load. 
However, there are energy savings compared to a constant flow system. For a system with pressure controlled at the pump, what we see is that the pump makes its design pressure at all loads. The GPM drops and the pump pressure does not rise. The pump speed reduction is limited because it gets no head relief from this control scheme. Still, it results in energy savings compared to simply riding the pump curve. If we control the pump at the most distant po point in the system, we provide only the static pressure the control valve and coil require at design conditions. At full load, this will result in the pump producing the full design pressure, but at part load, much less. At part load, the system pressure slides down the system curve. This allows the pump to slow down, enabling significant energy savings. Critical valve pump pressure reset reduces control valve pressure drop, which lowers the whole system operating curve. The pump benefits from a lower system curve at all loads. By monitoring the air handler control valve positions and controlling the pump pressure such that it is the minimum that will satisfy the most demanding air handler, we can basically convert the fixed static pressure to dynamic pressure. Let's summarize what we've seen with pressure-regulated closed pumping systems. The potential amount of energy saved with variable flow is a function of a number of system design criteria, control strategy being a key one. Depending on the design, the energy savings can approach that predicted by the pump affinity laws. And finally, overall, this is a great application for VFD-based speed control. This is bore out by the overwhelming use we see for VFDs in this application. Well, that's my time. Mick, your turn. Take us through variable flow on condenser water systems. Thanks for covering the chilled water pump portion of the system, Lee. Now, let's move over to the condenser water side. There are three topics we'll cover. Determining minimum pump speed, the effect of variable condenser water flow rate on the pump, cooling tower, and chiller, and controlling the condenser water pump to give better system performance. The minimum pump speed depends on a number of variables. The first is the minimum flow rate allowed through the chiller's condenser. This information can be gotten directly from the chiller manufacturer. Next, when we consider the condenser water loop, a portion of that loop is closed and a portion of the loop is open. Within the closed portion of the loop, the water elevation different does not add pressure the pump must push against. However, the pump must always overcome any elevation difference in the open portion of the loop. This open portion is at the cooling tower. The elevation difference between the cooling tower sump and the top of the cooling tower is known as static lift and must always be overcome. So in this case, the minimum for the pump is not a flow rate, but a speed at which the pump can still produce the pressure required to overcome the system pressure drop plus that tower static lift. The third possible limit for minimum condenser water flow is the minimum flow rate the tower manufacturer will allow. In order to maintain effective heat transfer, the tower fill must remain wetted. If the flow rate drops too far, portions of the tower can become dry, obviously affecting heat transfer. So if you're considering variable condenser water flow, make sure you work closely with the cooling tower provider. That way, they can provide the tower that can maintain good heat transfer as flow is reduced. Here's an example system that has 1,500 GPM as its design and the minimum flow rates on the slide. The limiting factor in this case is the tower static lift. To meet that lift requirement, we need to maintain a flow rate of at least 875 GPM. So a condenser water pump with a VFD reduces its energy consumption until it reaches 875 GPM then runs at a constant flow rate and power draw. Next, 
we'll look at how flow affects the rest of the system. The chiller and tower work together and that they're connected by the condenser water temperature and flow. As we'll see in Ryan's portion, this sets the lift or pressure difference the chiller must work against. The chiller power is also dependent on its design and the load it's producing at this point in time. The tower operation is dependent on its design as well as the heat rejection load and the ambient wet bulb temperatures. Both the chiller and the tower are affected when the condenser water flow rate is reduced. Let's look at an example to see how much. Cooling towers can reject heat at many conditions. Shown here is the performance of the cooling tower with a chiller load of 70 percent and an ambient wet bulb temperature of 70 degrees F. We've charted the temperature entering the cooling tower here and on the right side of the chart we see that the water temperature entering the tower is about 84 degrees at full flow. If we reduce the water flow rate the temperature entering the tower goes up. Since we're rejecting the same amount of heat with lower water flow, the water temperature entering the tower rises. For example, at 50% load, it's at about 96 degrees. Now, since the tower entering water temperature is the same as the chiller leaving condenser water temperature, we can look at the chiller power at each of these conditions. At the same chiller load as the water temperature leaving its condenser rises, so does chiller KW. This will be covered in a few minutes. Now, if we just looked at chiller KW, we'd never reduce the condenser water flow rate. But we need to add the cooling tower fan KW, the pump KW, and that chiller KW so we can see how the system operates. Remember, this is a snapshot in time. 70% load and 70 degree wet bulb. The minimum chiller plus condenser water pump plus cooling tower KW occurs between 80 and 90% of the condenser water flow rate. However, it's not that easy. So far we've assumed that the cooling tower fans are operating at full speed all the time. Since ASHRAE 90.1 requires speed control on cooling tower fans in many applications, a lot of people put VFDs on their cooling tower fans. So we need to examine how the entering tower water temperature changes when we reduce the flow rate and tower fan speed. Since reducing tower fan speed reduces airflow and heat rejection capability, the tower entering water temperature rises at reduced tower air flows as shown on this chart. So let's look at all of these flow rates and tower fan speeds and see how the system KW compares. When we look at all the possible operating points, we see that the system KW is at its minimum when the fans and pumps are at about 90% flow rate. But this graphic shows another important fact. Take the top blue line where the cooling tower fan is operated at 50% speed. Once the water flow rate drops below 80%, the temperature of water produced by the cooling tower rises so much that it sends the chiller's compressor into a surge region. If you're going to reduce flow rates and tower fan speeds, do so in a manner that keeps the chiller from surging. Okay. What we just looked at was the chiller operating at 70% load when the wet bulb is 70 degrees. What if the chiller is at 70% load but the ambient wet bulb is 50 degrees? This might occur in a multiple chiller plant when only one chiller is operating. Here, a tower fan speed of about 80% and a water flow rate of 80 to 90% is the best. Note that if the water flow gets turned down too far, the system KW rises, and it's significant. A piece of good news is that since the ambient wet bulb temperature is low enough, the chiller does not surge. Our final example examines the same system at 30% load and a wet bulb of 50 degrees. The system consumption is fairly flat, 
The one thing I'll note is that reducing tower fan speed makes sense at all water flow rates. Said another way, while chillers can operate with entering condenser water temperatures of 55 degrees, don't try to drive the tower water temperature as cold as possible. Back off on the tower fan speed and save some system energy consumption. Remember that the charts you saw here were for one specific application of a chiller, pump, and cooling tower. Depending on the efficiency of and power draw of each, the results can vary significantly. Nevertheless, sometimes we're asked for guidance when people are considering variable condenser water flow. First, you need to determine whether or not reducing condenser water flow rates should even be considered. If you've already minimized the condenser water pump KW, for example, by reducing its design flow rate to one and a half or two GPM per ton, it may not even make sense to take the time to look further. Also, reducing just the tower fan speed may give you most of the energy savings, and it's simpler. If you do decide to reduce condenser water flow rate during operation, know the minimum condenser water flow rate for your system. Then, to find efficient operating points at various load and ambient conditions, take the time to examine the system at all those loads and ambient wet bulb temperatures. What occurs in real life is quite different than what the ARI chiller rating standard assumes. One reason to study the system is to keep the chiller out of its surge region and allow it to meet the cooling load. This is especially important at wet bulb temperatures closer to design. Once you've done this work, write a detailed sequence of operation. Finally, there's no replacement for being out at the job site with the system operator and seeing what happens during operation. Consider being a part of the commissioning team. The bottom line is that variable condenser water flow allows some system savings, but it takes more design examination and on-site fine-tuning to achieve those savings. We suggest that first you reduce condenser water pump power at design, and you can easily do this by reducing the design flow rate. Then determine if variable flow is still warranted. Okay, I touched on how a chiller is impacted by external variables in a system. For example, condenser water entering and leaving temperatures and condenser water flow rate. Ryan is now going to take us inside the chiller so we can understand their impact. And more specifically, how a variable speed drive affects chiller performance as these external parameters change. We'll see it's quite different than the pump or fan effects we've seen so far. Thanks, Mick. Clearly, drive technology offers tangible energy saving opportunities, and the same can hold true for chillers. As Don pointed out earlier, the centrifugal chiller laws remind us that resistance to mass flow is not a function of refrigerant velocity. Rather, the resistance correlates to the pressure difference or lift the compressor must generate between the condenser and the evaporator. Therefore, resistance is not proportional to velocity squared. Instead, it is proportional to lift. I will explore these ideas in detail, but before I do, I'd like to share an often told story on this topic, as many believe the following analogy formulates a better understanding. It goes like this. Think of your vehicle's accelerator as a chiller's electric motor speed control. You can also think of the vehicle's brake as the inlet guide vanes or the unloading device. If you have a constant speed chiller, the electric motor runs at a constant speed, regardless of load. If the chiller needs to operate at off-design conditions, inlet guide vanes restrict the amount of refrigerant allowed in the compressor. Applying this concept to the story then, one might think of the accelerator being pegged to the floor, and to slow down, you press the brake. If you have a variable speed chiller, the analogy implies the electric motor slows down or speeds up depending on the load, just as the accelerator on an automobile. Common sense tells you that pegging the accelerator to the floor and using the brake to slow down is a terrible waste of fuel and can lead to added wear and tear. 
the analogy implies the same conclusion. That is, without a VSD on the chiller, electricity is wasted and mechanical wear and tear increases. Simple and easily understood. Let's test the accuracy by looking into the science. First, as a reminder, centrifugal chillers convert kinetic energy into static energy by increasing the pressure and temperature of the refrigerant. The six main components contained on every centrifugal chiller are the evaporator, the condenser, the compressor, a pressure reducing device, a capacity modulation device, and an integrated unit mounted controller. At the core of the centrifugal chiller compressor is a rotating impeller fit with blades that draws refrigerant vapor into the radial passages. Capacity modulation is done utilizing a mechanical device commonly referred to as inlet guide vanes. Centrifugal chillers run at a fixed speed or RPM and because the speed is fixed at reduced capacity conditions the chiller needs a means to unload. Inlet guide vanes control the refrigerant flow by modulating the vapor prior to entering the impeller. Also enabled by the unique characteristics of centrifugal compression, inlet guide vanes pre-whirl the vapor optimizing the chiller's efficiency at a reduced load. So even though the chiller remains at constant speed, less refrigerant gas is processed, reducing the compressor's work and resulting in less power drawn. So returning to the analogy, even on a constant speed chiller, you ease off on the accelerator at part load. Looking closer at the compressor, the impeller rotates, accelerating the refrigerant vapor, increasing its velocity and consequently its kinetic energy. Then as the area increases in the diffuser passages, static pressure is generated as the velocity of the refrigerant decreases and is converted to static energy. Finally, the high pressure refrigerant collects in the volute around the perimeter of the compressor where the final energy conversion to static pressure is completed. The now elevated temperature and pressure refrigerant travels to the condenser completing the compression cycle. The compressor then generates a pressure differential or head. The conventional reference to a compressor lift was adopted simply because the compressor elevates the refrigerant's pressure from the evaporator to the condenser. Because the direct correlation between refrigerant pressures and their associated leaving water temperatures, for convenience, lift is often communicated as the difference in leaving evaporator and leaving condenser water temperatures. Load, by contrast, is independent of vessel pressures and dependent upon the flow rate and the dif temperature difference of the water crossed only the chiller's evaporator. Applying some number, these concepts become clear. Here, a chiller operating at full load produces 800 GPM of 41 degree water with a 15 degree delta T across the evap and receives 2 GPM per ton of 85 degree condenser water resulting in a leaving condenser temperature of 99 degrees. The load on this chiller is defined as 500 tons and the required compressor head, while is dependent on the pressures, is simply referred to as 58 degrees of lift. Unmistakably, load and lift are related to total compressor work, ultimately corresponding to the amount of potential energy savings. This graphic, referred to as the compressor work rectangle, illustrates this distinct relationship. The width of the rectangle represents the mass flow of refrigerant through the compressor and translates into chiller cooling capacity, or load, and measured in tons. The height of the rectangle represents compressor head, or lift, required by the compressor. So, referring to the previous example, the load is 500 tons and the lift is 58 degrees. Now, let's take a look at the origin of the work rectangle. As referred to earlier, the refrigerant leaving the impeller and work done by the compressor is kinetic, as represented by the resultant velocity vector here. This refrigerant velocity vector is broken down into two key components, a radial vector and a tangential vector. The radial vector moves the refrigerant away from the impeller and the tangential vector acts to move the refrigerant in the direction of the impeller's rotation. Radial velocity for a given compressor is directly proportional to the flow rate of refrigerant vapor through the compressor. 
and tangential velocity is proportional to tip speed. Applying the compressor work rectangle then, we can see how it functions to represent these concepts. Centrifugal compression is correlated closely with refrigerant mass flow rate determined by the building's load and out of our direct control, impeller diameter determined by the chiller's full load design conditions and fixed upon final selection configuration, and impeller tip speed, also determined by the chiller's final full load design selection, but can change if a chiller is equipped with a variable speed drive. How do the variables of refrigerant mass flow rate and impeller tip speed affect compressor work? First, consider a given diameter compressor impeller that rotates at a constant speed. As the load on the chiller decreases, the inlet vanes partially close and the flow rate of refrigerant through the compressor drops. Radial velocity, which is proportional to refrigerant flow, decreases as well. Even though the speed of rotation and diameter of the impeller are constant, the radial velocity drops due to the additional pressure drop caused by the inlet vanes reducing the flow of refrigerant. As a result, less static pressure is produced and less power is drawn from the compressor motor. Because centrifugal compression is variable volume, as the system load decreases and the chiller operates at a part load condition, the chiller will draw less power, whether it's a constant speed or variable speed chiller. In this application, applying variable speed drives and slowing the impeller's tip speed may reveal some benefit. However, slowing the impeller too much will result in surge. Now let's move our attention from part load to part lift. Consider the same given diameter compressor impeller that rotates at a constant speed. Even though the speed of the rotation and diameter of the impeller are constant, the tangential velocity drops due to the additional pressure drop imparted on the refrigerant by the inlet vanes. This reduces compressor work at part lift conditions, thus reducing the power draw of the compressor. Once again, this reduction in power occurs without a reduction in the impeller's tip speed. The efficiency of the compressor could be further improved by eliminating the losses imparted by the inlet guide vanes. And this can be done by reducing the impeller's tip speed. Enter variable speed drives. Now, while tangential vector and radial vectors remain the same, reducing tip speed more effectively repositions and matches the chiller's operational requirements when a part lift condition occurs, resulting in a further reduction in energy drawn. Bottom line, while applying variable speed drives to centrifugal compressors may gain minimal benefit at part load, the real savings tie directly to a reduction in lift. Applying these concepts to the compressor work rectangle will graphically demonstrate that lift is reduced only through two means. One, lowering the condensing temperature by delivering colder condenser water than design, or two, increasing the evaporator temperature by resetting the chilled water set point warmer. Understanding the difference between load and lift is critical to ensure the benefits of drive technology are attainable and balance the higher first cost with potential energy savings. As discussed, centrifugal compressors are variable volume. Therefore, either inlet guide vanes alone or the combination of inlet guide vanes and a variable speed drive will respond to a change in load and result in reduced power consumption. All types of centrifugal chillers benefit from lower condensing temperatures. Variable speed drives simply allow more benefit by improving the part lift efficiency of chillers. Ryan, let me take a shot at showing how chiller savings compares to fan and pump savings that we've already looked at. Okay. I think of the static lift of the cooling tower as comparable to the compressor lift. A condenser pump must always overcome the water elevation difference between the cooling tower sump and the top of the cooling tower. And the chiller's compressor must overcome the difference in pressures between the evaporator and the condenser. I like the comparison. So from a comparison standpoint, we can look at the energy consumption of a free discharge cooling tower fan a chilled water pump using a DP sensor at the end of the loop, a condenser water pump that had to stop at 875 GPM, 
and a chiller running with reduced condenser water temperature and thus lower lift. So this shows the chillers do not benefit from the cube of the savings rule of thumb. Exactly. The chiller evaporator and condenser water temperatures make might what be thought of as a, a DP set point for the chiller. Okay, with that said, Ryan, let's look back at that analogy you began with. It seems pretty simple. Maybe too simple? Yes, I think of it as simply misleading and technically wrong. As we've seen, it misrepresents how a VSD integrates with the fundamentals of centrifugal compression, leading people to incorrect conclusions and misapplications of drives. Simply stated, variable speed drive chillers do not follow the cubic savings rule of thumb. Now let me take a few minutes to discuss rating of chillers. Because there is a clear need to establish minimum efficiency standards, ARI, the Air Conditioning and Refrigeration Institute, created standard 550-590 as an attempt to identify a single variable or unit of measure to represent a chiller's performance rating. IPLV, or integrated part load value, is defined as a weighted average of compressor work by combining both part load and associated part lift into four arbitrary predefined conditions. Now, remember, part load and part lift are different, so the assumptions made are critical. Unrealistic assumptions will lead to incorrect performance conclusions. NPLV, or non-standard part load value was also established to allow the chiller's design operating conditions to vary while reusing the same IPLV formulas and associated load and lift predefined buckets. Symbolically, applying the compressor work rectangle to the IPLV NPLV variable might look something like this. The assumption is all hours of operation would fit into these four fixed conditions. That is to say, all of the hours operating at certain load conditions would simultaneously be operating at reduced lift conditions. This model might provide a means by which to compare one chiller's performance to another, but it will not, nor was it intended to, be representative of how a chiller will operate within a system. The ARI standard simply cannot accurately represent a chiller's energy use in a system, nor can the IPLV NPLV value predict the savings that can be associated with an additional investment of a drive. As suggested in the Appendix D of the standard, careful analysis is the only real method to reach fiscally responsible decisions. Looking closer and combining representative chiller performance values with the four arbitrary chosen conditions for IPLV highlights another controversial industry issue. That is, the recent claims that running two chillers with variable speed drives at part load is more efficient than one chiller fulfilling that same load. Of course, if attention is focused on these numbers, the assertion seems authentic. Here, the 50% load value of 0.324 kW per ton has a commanding efficiency advantage over the full load value of 0.572. But the 50% load number has condenser water that is 20 degrees colder than the full load number. Of course it looks more efficient. Its lift has been reduced. Again, variable speed drive chillers are part lift devices. We need to compare the chiller at the same condenser water temperature. Let's do that. The results for a system load of 90% and with the condenser water temperatures shown are represented here in the table. Unmistakably, in all but the most reduced lift condition, one variable speed chiller operating at 90% load consumes less power than two equally loaded variable speed chillers. It's worth emphasizing that this comparison does what IPLV cannot compares like chillers in like conditions. Apples to apples, if you will. Representing the same data in graphical format punctuates that running one chiller consumes less power than running two at all but the coldest of condenser water temperatures. Remember, as Mick discussed, these cold condenser water conditions may not be economically attained. Also, 
Pump and tower energy are not included in these numbers. Only the chiller energy is shown here. When a chiller is brought online, the associated ancillary equipment consumes power too. If we leave a chiller off, there is no ancillary consumption. After all, there is no substitute for off when trying to maximize energy savings. We found that VSD chillers can often be justified when there are lots of run hours at low lift conditions and with high energy rates during those run hours. One example where a VSD chiller often pays back is a chiller that operates during the winter. It has a lot of hours at low lift conditions, but it's imperative to analyze the system to make proper life cycle decisions. Only a system study that incorporates all aspects of location dependent weather, building diversity, and chiller performance characteristics will be able to determine if applying variable speed drives to chillers is economical, such as a comprehensive hour by hour analysis tool. BIN methods can't do this. Programs like Trace, DOE, Chiller Plant Analyzer, or HAP help you give the owner the information to make life cycle cost decisions. The science of variable speed technology and its application to centrifugal chillers is similar but discernibly different from pumps and fans. I leave you with these thoughts. First, there are many analogies and misconceptions surrounding this topic and hopefully the discussions exposes the need for concern and a word of caution. Perhaps the use of the compressor work rectangle may better serve the industry to best represent drives on chillers. Also, remember that variable speed drives impact centrifugal chillers part lift efficiency, not part load. As such, the combination does not follow the often referenced cubic savings rule of thumb. And only an analysis, not a single number like IPLV or NPLV, can adequately represent how drives will perform. Bottom line, variable speed drives are viable and effective and should be applied to centrifugal chillers to maximize energy savings in the right application. You know, it always comes back to using the proper technology in the proper application and checking those economics. And now it's time to move to our question and answer session. Thanks for faxing yours in today. We have a pile. We won't get all to them, to all of them while we're on the air, but we will get back to you within four weeks. Uh, Don, the first one's coming to you from up in Canada. A couple of companies are marketing a magnetic clutch type of speed control for fans. They're making claims of energy savings equal to or better than variable speed drives. Can you comment on this? Oh, a flash from the past. The device is called an eddy current clutch. Um, and the savings that you can get with an eddy current clutch on a pump or a fan will be comparable to the savings that you can get on a variable speed drive. As we've shown today, nothing can be better than RPM cubed. And our attempt to get to RPM cubed really determines how much savings we're going to get. So it may be the method of control that's more important than the actual control device. One thing to consider about an eddy current clutch is it's mounted in line with the motor, not on the wall like a drive might be. So there might be some mechanical room issues. Great stuff, Don. Thanks. Lee, next one's coming down to you. With variable pumping, do control valves need to be sized differently? There's really two issues with sizing a valve. One is the getting the right size valve, the CV rating, and uh, the way you size that really doesn't change with constant um, or variable flow. Um, the other part is the close off, and uh, I guess when I say constant flow, I mean a constant speed pump riding, riding the curve. Um, the other rating on the pump that, or the valve you have to be really concerned about is the close off rating. And if you're riding the pump curve, the pressure the valve will have to close off against will be quite a bit more than if you have a VFD being controlled well. So be very aware of the close off rating when you're sizing the valve in any system. Um, I think that's the critical component. There's a lot of evidence that uh, if we don't do that right, it can cause a number of operational problems in uh, chilled water and hot water systems.
The next one's coming to our new guy, Ryan. Ryan, can you speak a bit about why harmonics are produced when using VFDs and what can be done to minimize and manage the electrical disturbances in the system? The topic actually is one of those uh, highly confusing topics, again, in, in the industry, misrepresented, misunderstood, misconceptions out there. We actually dedicated an entire broadcast back in January 2001, Customer Solutions Live, addressing this issue in detail. As well, we've just released a new engineering newsletter, which Mick will actually reference uh, later, that addresses this issue in detail. It, so I hope that that addresses the question. Mick? And really, harmonics do need to be looked at from a system-wide level because you have variable frequency drives that uh, cause those harmonics in a lot of locations. So we need to look at the facility. Don, another one coming over to you. An air handler with a five horsepower fan and VFD will have a higher nameplate full load amperage than a constant speed fan with a starter. Can you please explain that? If you are measuring amp input to a starter versus amp input to a drive, you will have a higher input because of losses in the drive. Pretty simple one there, thanks. The next one's coming to Mick. Uh, do we still need a tower water bypass valve if we have a variable speed flow on the condenser water side. In order for a chiller to operate, it needs to have a minimum pressure differential between the evaporator and the condenser within a certain period of time. And that pressure differential and the time changes depending on the type of chiller it is. You have to be able to build it up within that time. Uh, we've had engineering bulletins for years that talk about you can use a variable frequency drive as long as you can get that pressure differential. You could use a tower bypass. So it's really uh, specific to the particular application. VFDs are used and can be used sometimes. Uh, Lee, one coming over to you. Is there further benefit to critical valve reset strategy by using chilled water temperature reset on a chilled water loop? The, the two control schemes, critical valve reset and chill water reset, are really conflict, conflicting, excuse me, uh, conflicting schemes. And so um, if you're using, if you're trying to reduce the flow and you reset the water temperature, you actually have to increase the flow. So, so the two conflict, they don't complement, unfortunately. Um, what we typically advise is um, take your take your savings on the pump side as much as you can and only at if you want to try to use chill water reset on a variable flow system only use it at the very lowest loads when you've already gotten all the flow savings and your pumps are are slowed down a long ways um, and have saved all the energy they can and one way I like to look at it Lee is that the COP or coefficient of performance on a chiller is about six to seven the COP of a pump is about 0.6 or 0.7. So work the higher efficiency piece of equipment a little bit harder. And until you get to that low load condition, chill water reset often doesn't make sense. Don, another airside one coming over to you. If the best location for the differential pressure sensor for pump control is at the most diff distant place of the system, why is this not the case for air systems? It probably is the case. The issue is if you put the sensor on an airside system at a remote location, you can have air valves that don't get enough air. I think that's one of the advantages of critical valve, critical zone reset on airside systems as well as critical valve reset on water systems because that method of control, your sensor is always in the right location because it's at every user. Thanks, Don. Ryan, another one coming over to you. How do VFDs benefit systems, and this is on chillers, I guess, in areas such as Houston, which will have a higher annual average wet bulb? And this is going to be our last question we can take. The, this highlights uh, the, an issue when applying VFDs to drives. As the presentation pointed out, lift is the primary means by which a drive on a chiller will uh, end up resulting in energy savings. So the bottom line answer is you'll get less opportunity to achieve any energy savings in that, op in that environment, Miami, Houston, and simply an analysis of the chiller and the drive and how it operates in the system is the only real way to figure out that the first cost can be offset. 
In fact, another analysis they might want to do is not necessarily put the money into a drive, but also look at a higher efficiency piece of equipment because it's an economic payback for the building owner. Absolutely. Okay. Great. Thanks, folks. Uh, and to summarize what we've covered today, all drive effects are not created equal. While we know what the fan laws say about the cubic relationship, this very rarely occurs in HVAC systems. Fan and pump savings are ex affected extensively by the control method chosen. And in chillers, the pressure difference the compressor must overcome is defined by external parameters, most often chilled and condenser water temperature. Lee showed us that the closest we come to the cubic relationship is at the cooling tower, and that reducing cooling tower fan speed can increase system efficiency. Make sure you look at the system and not just either the pump or the, uh, the tower or the chiller. Don covered how VFDs on fans work within the system and showed us that the savings are predicated on the control strategy. Fan pressure optimization is the best and remember that ASHRAE 90.1 requires this on DDC VAV systems. Chilled water pumps work in a similar manner to HVAC supply fans in that the control method is also critical. Pump pressure optimization is being used as a more common system control method. On the condenser water side, you have to keep the pump speed high enough to meet the minimum flow rate or pressure and you really need to understand how the reduced condenser water flow rate affects the chiller and tower performance. We suggest that before taking the time to investigate that relationship for your particular job, that you reduce the condenser water pump design power by selecting it at a lower flow rate. Next, no matter how a chiller is controlled, power is reduced at part load and part lift. The present rating standard makes some inaccurate assumptions about the lift because of the bins it puts things in. A better analysis is warranted and the tools are available. Having a VFD on a chiller can work very well as long as it's in the proper application, that is, reduced lift conditions. In order for the drive to save energy, it must be able to slow down. So for the drive to slow down, the pressure difference or lift must be reduced. So the, remember that a VFD on the chiller helps part lift operation and this needs to be analyzed properly. Another aspect of drives we didn't have time to cover today is that engine generators or gen sets are being used in more facilities today to provide backup for critical loads such as hospitals or data processing. A myth sometimes heard today is that the gen set can be downsized when variable speed drives are used. This is not true across the board. In fact, there are times when the genset actually has to be oversized. In February of 2005, the National ASHRAE meetings held a very clear discussion on this topic. Please take a look at the newsletter written by Court and Abuta to help you understand genset issues if that applications arise. There are a number of publications available so you can investigate today's topics further. We put together a bibliography detailing a number of third-party articles and web links that we think you'll find helpful. It's available from your local site coordinator. We thank you in advance for filling out an evaluation before you leave. It really helps us to improve. The rest of, of the 2006 broadcasts are shown on the screen. We'll hope you join us in May. In September, which will be our 25th ENL broadcast, and then later in November. We'll see you back here in May.